Hi, I'm Jerry Grassi. I'm one of the elders at Creekside Community Church. And the reason I'm here is because, like many of you, uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder earlier this year and the unrest that's fouled, I was asking, what can I do to help uh, with racial inequality and those less privileged than me in my general community? And the result of that is the conversation I'm going to have with you with my good friend, Karen Monroe. And just so you know how well I know Karen, both of us did not have glasses when we first <laughs> met. Uh, so Karen, maybe introduce yourself and talk about what you do. I will. I'll do it just briefly because uh, there's something I want you to see. So my name is Karen Monroe. I'm the Alameda County Superintendent of Schools. Uh, elected position, Contra Costa County has one too. And uh, I count it a privilege that I get to stand in the gap for the least served students in my county. Uh, we had a students at Juvenile Hall and in some other academic settings. Uh, today, I really wanted to share with the congregation uh, a video and uh, what it does is capture in student voices, really what they're going through during this pandemic and at other times. So I'd invite you to watch and uh, learn more about what our students go through on a daily basis. And what I'm always impressed by is how resilient and brave uh, these students are, that I think most of us in similar uh, circumstances would not continue to move forward in the ways that they do to make sure that they have their learning, that they take care of their children and their families in a lot of ways. In those transitions and, and things that have been going on since the shelter in place, um, a lot of the, our students and their guardians have lost their jobs. Do you live alone or do you live with other family members? I or? live with my mom. It was also hard for my mom. Okay. She had to also leave her job and start something new. Las cosas más difícil este fue como el, la escasez de dinero, de trabajo, uh, de comida. How was life different for you in the pandemic? Um, the pandemic, life was really hard for me. Um, I actually, I had a baby during the pandemic. Well, I had a baby in February. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Um, I, I, when I first had him, it was hard for me to be able to get his shots because places were closed. Because of COVID, um, we didn't have enough money for diapers. Or it was to pay the bills for the water and gas, or it was to buy diapers, right? And it was hard for me because um, work. I needed to go back to work, but I didn't have that option because my job was closed down. The need um, is felt deeply uh, with our students here and with their families. And what's true is that these are things that they struggle with on a daily basis, but the pandemic has exacerbated some of those things. I remember having to ask the guy at the liquor store for um, if my dad could come by later after work and pay for the milk, you know? Había muchos recursos, pero Cuando yo iba me decían que estaba ocupado los lugares, entonces me rechazaba y no solo a mí, sino que era como a un grupo. It's really hard being African American because, you know, people look at us as a threat. So it's harder for us to get what we need and want. Entonces sí fue muy difícil. Fue muy difícil encontrar un, un, un recurso, un programa donde te puedan ayudar con comida, porque creo que son muchas personas más de lo normal. I told Ms. Vero that I needed uh, resources for food because people, we couldn't go to church anymore. We had to um, close off everything. Para poder vivir, sobrevivir, la renta, la comida, todas nuestras necesidades. Cleaning products, um, toilet paper, um, what else? Food. I was just going to say, how are you Water. Food? It's hard, you know, first come, first serve, so you got to be ready, prepared in the morning when stores first open. When those students that tend to fall through the cracks, if they don't get help from our school, which is usually the first stop in which they get services, we may never see them again. And um, that's what hurts because we're talking about multiple generations that are in need. So I am grateful for those who are interested in helping, those who are in providing resources for uh, the young people and the families that we serve. Uh, anything is useful, but I think it's most important to make sure you're hearing from the voices of those who have needs, to make sure that we're as thoughtful as possible 
about giving them the resources that are truly needed. So thank you so much for your generosity, for your interest and your caring uh, at every step along the way. You make the work we do possible. Wow, those were, those were really compelling stories. And you can see how uh, Karen and the fund she manages is really meeting tangible needs of those in our community. We'd like to give you an opportunity to, to be a part of it. And on the screen, you can see a website, which is the Alameda County Opportunity Education Fund. Uh, the website is just acoefund.org. And if you go to that website, there's a big blue donate button. Just click it and you can help out those really in our own neighborhood, if you will, uh, meeting specific needs. The great thing about this fund is it helps meet really tangible needs and there's absolutely no admin and it's fully tax deductible. So we hope you'll join us in helping those in our community. Thanks. Hi there, wherever you are. Join us in worship. Uh, we're going to sing together. We're going to raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a
Good morning, Creekside. Um, I am back to you to give you a second message in a series of two messages. If you listen to last week's message, I am giving you uh, two messages that come from the book of Proverbs entitled, A Sage Response to Emotional Pain. Part one was God's perspective from Proverbs, and part two is how not to be a jerk. <laughs> so we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, I do want to report back to you because I know last week I mentioned that we are all one spilled cup of coffee away from a breakdown, and this week I spilled two entirely full cups of coffee, and I think my saving grace is that I had eight people working in the house, so I did not break down. Um, but on another random note, as just based on things that I've been seeing in social media, before I begin talking about anything in Proverbs, I wanted to really give a shout out to all of the teachers out there. I know we have a lot in our body, and we have a lot of kids who are um, in virtual classrooms, and I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for all of your extra effort you've put forth transitioning lessons to a virtual environment. Thank you for sitting in empty rooms or in living rooms with kids around you while you're trying to teach. Thank you for doing your best to connect with kids, some of whom show up on screen, some of whom don't. Thank you for staying committed to your profession and to your kids. Thank you for not giving up. I know guidelines are changing almost daily. Um, we appreciate what you do, and I just wanted to honor your hard work and your dedication. So it's not intentional that I'm transitioning from my gratitude for our teachers to the topic of emotional pain, but there is continuity in acknowledging that whatever we're doing right now, however we're going about our lives while we're trying to navigate this shelter-in-place order, um, we're adapting, but we're missing community. We're having to bear our own burdens with little support and a lot of external stress. Across the board, we are feeling the pressure in one way or another. Proverbs speaks to us in this life setting. If anyone is wondering if the Bible has relevancy for today, I hope you see in the message last week and today that God is constantly speaking to our hearts through his word. We are all in the middle of a hurricane right now. Chaos and debris are flying through the air and we just wanna get through it safely. As I touch on the individual expressions of emotional turmoil that are mentioned in Proverbs, I'm doing so to draw us into the eye of the hurricane, the calming anchor of God's presence. In the broader context of acknowledging the pain that exists in the Christian life, God speaks into that pain. I will also be sharing with you some of the Proverbs that empower us and instruct us to speak into these difficult spaces. We are not left in our pain, but God gives us community in order to hold us up while we walk through it. And the author of Proverbs has a lot to say about how we show up in other people's lives, or in other words, how not to be a jerk. Having said that, let's talk about heartache. Um, we talked about anxiety last week. We talked about a heart that's dragged along. Uh, so we're going to continue on the topic of emotional turmoil and address heartache. Proverbs 14.10 says, each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. Proverbs 14.13 says, even in laughter the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. These two proverbs describe a heart that experiences bitterness and grief, a heart that aches. They acknowledge the pain of life that is at once unique to each individual and common to humanity. The writer of Proverbs doesn't identify the source of the ache or the bitterness, but he acknowledges the reality that for the person who is in pain, the pain solely belongs to him or her. It is something in which we feel the separateness and the loneliness of humanity. A friend of mine recently posted a gorgeous, smiling photo of herself on Facebook, and her caption read, this is the face of depression. Her post beautifully illustrates this proverb. If you were to meet her, and some of you may have met her, you would describe her as positive, bubbly, encouraging, and full of laughter. And she is all of those things. But while she's able to put on this public presentation of joy and positive energy, 
it belies the real struggle she has had with depression. At times, her effervescent joy is authentic, and at times, it covers up a heart that's aching. I applaud her for her honesty and her willingness to be vulnerable um, to the world, to be vulnerable in a, a, on social media, and her desires to draw attention to the unseen suffering that so many people face. In Proverbs 14, 13, we read about the person whose heartache is so deep that laughter may temporarily provide relief, but it cannot quiet the dull, consistent noise of the hurt. When we attend memorial services, we treasure the moments that make us laugh. They momentarily lift us out of our grief. Yet when the laughter ends, the grief makes its presence known. There are two components to this reality. The first is the truth that we all experience. All of us endure painful experiences, and this proverb hits home. For most of us, the pain lessens over time, and moments of laughter and rejoicing are more enduring. Depending on the source of the pain, it might be a dull ache that we carry with us always, or it might truly disappear. For many people, however, this proverb speaks to the everyday reality of their emotional landscape. There may be a sadness or grief that is pervasive, and while laughter may mask the pain or even temporarily soothe the pain, when it ends, the pain returns like a crashing wave. This may be something you or someone you know lives with on a daily basis. The beauty of this proverb is that it recognizes the reality of this emotional struggle. It doesn't show us the way out. It doesn't give us a remedy. It simply gives us permission to feel our grief. Proverbs is an intensely practical book. The verses we have looked at are descriptive. It tells us what's happening, and it gives us really pithy solutions to our problems. When we turn to the book of Psalms, we have a deeper perspective as we're shown how to take our problems and our pain directly to the Father. In the book of Psalms, we see the psalmist bend under his grief and cry out for God to enter into his experience. In Psalm 119.28, the psalmist writes, My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. The psalmist takes his pain directly to God. He brings his grief into the framing structure of God's word. We have a God who's well acquainted with grief and who can sustain us in the midst of our struggles. The constantly shifting sand beneath us is no match for his constancy and his faithfulness. When we go to his word, when we seek him for comfort, he is there for us as a father who grieves on our behalf. In Proverbs, our pain is also described as heartache or bitterness of heart. Um, it's a crushed or a broken spirit. There are three Proverbs that use either phrase, all of which reflect the same Hebrew underlying. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a happy heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. And Proverbs 18, 14 says, a spirit of man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? In the first two Proverbs, the heart or the seat of our emotions and our spirit, which is our breath of life, are contrasted. Although they are different concepts, they are intended to be understood as separate components of who we are. In Hebrew poetry, they are roughly synonymous terms that poetically compare the experience of joy or a happy heart with that of the brokenness of pain. The phase for broken spirit occurs in all three of our verses. There's no deeper nuance to this term except to say that it's a spirit that has been beaten down. There is deep pain involved, and some of us might be at the point where we feel like our spirit is crushed, our hope is deflated. Real and devastating hardships are hitting us. The world is scary and unstable right now, and I don't know what your individual hardships might look like. You might 
be at your breaking point at the difficulties of online schooling, working at home, uh, maybe you've lost your job, maybe you're struggling with your health, your health. Just trying to get by day to day is a consistent struggle. The current political tsunami that's dragging us through the water um, can bring us all down. There are just a few, these are just a few, and any one of them is enough to weigh our hearts down. By contrast, it's the happy heart that brings healing. It's the happy heart that changes our disposition. This is not to say that if we're broken in spirit, we just need to put on a smile. I believe that the opposite is true. We can experience joy that transforms us, and we can experience pain that breaks us. Both are common experiences. The author of Proverbs lays the two, these two truths before us so we can look in the mirror and see ourselves. We may see health and goodness. We may see brokenness and pain. Both are allowed and both are validated. We definitely desire one over the other, but our pains in life are not wasted. Like my friend who shared her struggles with depression, she acknowledges it as something to work through and something to draw her closer to God, to draw her closer to others who struggle with the same um, depression. The next proverb I want to look at is Proverbs 1430 because it gives us a hint regarding what can make the, health, the heart healthy and what can make the heart ache. Proverbs 1430 says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy, um, passion or desire for an object rots the bones. When a native Hebrew speaker asks you how you're doing, they ask, how is your shalom? And this is true in the Bible as well. Ma shalom ha or ma shalom ha, depending on whether you're male or female. So one might expect the word shalom to be used in this proverb that speaks to a peaceful heart because that's often how shalom is translated. But the author uses a different word. The Hebrew word that's translated peace comes from the verb to heal. This proverb tells us that a heart at peace is a heart that is physically healthy, that is physically healed. In Proverbs, this word for peace is also used to describe words that are spoken. Proverbs 12.18 says the tongue of the wise brings healing. In Proverbs 15.4, a healing tongue is a tree of life. In Proverbs 16.24, it says pleasant words are sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. In Proverbs 14.30, the heart is described in this matter. A healthy heart is calm, tranquil, and at peace. It brings life to our physical body. This idea of a healthy heart is understood by comparing it to an unhealthy heart that damages the physical body. The result of tranquility is a body that's healthy, whereas discontent destroys us physically, bringing disease. The reason I want to look at this proverb is because up to this point, the proverbs we have looked at presume a person's condition, anxiety, depression, uh, being in turmoil or grieving, but they don't tell us why, they don't tell us the cause. This proverb provides a look into one possible source of our pain. It says that envy or passion rots the bones. Another way of talking about this is idolatry. We desire that which we do not have or we perceive we do not have. We focus on the unknown. Um, we look back to the known. Jeff Klipnis brought this up a couple of weeks ago saying that we are longing for the leeks and the onions of Egypt while God is calling us forward to experience him in a new way. We also look around at what others have, what they're doing, and wonder why everything is going so well for them. I know someone who moved to Hawaii, and he keeps posting beach pictures, um, and I want to tell him to cut it out and stop making the rest of us feel bad, because his life right now is beautiful beaches, beautiful food, and rainbows that arch across his balcony, and he's kind of a jerk. Um, actually, he's amazing, but... I'm the one that has the problem. I know he has had pain and hardship in his life. 
I don't know what led to his Hawaiian paradise, but I, I do want good things for him. It only serves to remind me um, that so many of us are not experiencing good things right now, or it feels like we're not experiencing good things right now. The problem is not in what my friend posts, but in how I look at it. It is the value that I ascribe to it. What does it tell me about my self-belief, and what does it tell me about what I value? I may envy a person for their ability to thrive and succeed in the middle of our chaotic world. If I were to have a similar experience, what would that say about me? I'm smart, talented, successful. Essentially, it reveals that I do not feel valued or worthwhile or that I'm afraid. What if I were to treat this ailment in my life? What if I focused on what would enable me to feel worthy and valuable? What if I'm my own stumbling block? We think that being at peace is a static experience, that it's a state of being. On the contrary, a heart at peace is a heart that's healthy. It's a heart that is constantly working to dismantle false beliefs that keep us submerged in things that rot the bones. It's a heart that challenges thoughts and feelings that negate the truth of who we are in Christ. We are valued. We are worthwhile. We are treasured by the God who loves us and gave his son for us. Anything that tells us otherwise is a lie that needs to be confronted. As we actively trust in God's opinion of ourselves and we challenge beliefs that, that oppose this reality, we will then be on the path to discovering what it is to have a heart that's at peace in the spite of the challenges surrounding us. So how do we speak to someone in pain? How do we respond to ourselves when we are in pain? As we move from our experience of pain and of hope, we will be transitioning into talking about how to love others well when they are in pain. The most well-known story of a poor response to pain is that of Job and his friends. And I won't pretend that Job was an easy guy to be around. I, I think I would have a hard time being around him. Uh, he suffered devastating loss. He lost his children, his financial status, his social status, and his health. He reeled in deep anguish. He cried out to God. He yelled at God. He stopped talking to God. He accused God. His friends initially had a great response. They sat with him quietly. But as they watched him wrestle with God, they started giving him advice. You can't talk to God like that. It must have been something you did. You're probably being punished. Maybe you don't even know what you did. You should probably confess. Job's friends fired back at him and ultimately blamed him for his struggles. At a certain point, his friends stopped talking. But the silence was not compassion. It was abandonment. Job is left alone to cry out to God, and he does so in every way imaginable. He praises God, he accuses God, he pours out his pain to God, but he never stops talking to God. And God answers. God meets Job in his pain. He doesn't tell them that he's to blame, tell him that he's to blame. He doesn't tell him that he needs to suck it up and get back on the field. He tells him that he is the creator, and even though Job doesn't understand the why, he needs to trust in the who. A day will come when all things are made right. And as Job and the creator locked eyes, so to speak, Job melts into God's presence and relaxes into his being. This is the most important thing to know about the story of Job. We all know that at the end of the book, he has a reversal of fortune. But this is not the overall point in the book. In fact, to be honest, if I were writing Job, I would have left it out. Um, the main point is that while Job is in the very midst of his pain, while he's sitting in ashes, he's covered in boils, he finds rest in God the Father. Everything that follows, including his friends getting chastised by God, is just icing. You may see yourself as Job. Maybe you're suffering right now. All of us are suffering to some extent, but some certainly more than others. Maybe you are a friend 
or you're a family member who is coming alongside someone who is struggling. And maybe you're simply a human being who from time to time is in a situation where you're called to come along someone in their pain. So how do we do this and do it well? Here are some guidelines to follow. One, make sure there are a lot of people around. So parties, family gatherings, large group meetings, and if you can't get your point across, then let other people chime in. Two, serve a lot of alcohol because that goes really well. Three, talk over the person when something they say is stupid. Four, make sure to tell them that you have it worse or you know someone who has it worse. Five, give them a pat on the back and tell them to stop crying and feel better. Six, if they aren't responding well, then start yelling and maybe throw a glass or two for good effect. Seven, if that doesn't work, then just start talking about them behind their back to all of your friends. I think these are the real housewife guidelines. I think I'm reading the wrong guidelines. Um, not that I've ever seen that show, so I wouldn't know. But what I do know is that reality TV gives us caricatures and drama. They teach us how to pick up a sword rather than speak a soft word that is honest and caring. And we don't often see wise, thoughtful interactions in real life. Many of us have to make the effort to learn to be a good friend, to learn how to care for those around us who are hurting, or simply learn to be supportive and caring in our relationships. Luckily for us, the author of Proverbs speaks a lot on the topic of words. He knows the power of the tongue, that it has the ability to both heal and wound. So we are given instruction upon instruction on when to open our mouth, when not to open our mouth, and once we do, what words should come out. The following guidelines come from someone whose advice is trustworthy and proven. So guidelines on speaking to someone in pain from Proverbs. One, there needs to be a trusted relationship. Proverbs uses the words friend, brother, and sister. Two, we are called to listen first before answering. Three, don't try to cheer a person up. Four, give a timely word. And last week we talked about a good word, how that cheers up the heart. And five, be honest and speak the truth. So let's look at the first guideline and some proverbs that relate to it. So one, there needs to be a trusted relationship when we are entering into another person's life and entering into their struggles. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Have you ever had the experience of having someone you don't know very well speak into your life? Unless they're amazingly wise and kind, it usually doesn't go very well. We need to earn the right to listen, to hear, and to speak to the hearts of others. When my son Gerard was born, he was six weeks early, and he had to spend a few weeks in the neonative intensive care unit. Even though he was healthy, it was traumatic. To, I had to leave the hospital without my baby. Um, I had to watch him get poked and stuck with IVs. He still has little scars on his hands and feet, and he's 19. Um, to see him hooked up to all of the monitors and, monitors and to be in there with all of the other babies was really heartbreaking. And so just one more shout out to the doctors and the nurses in the NICU units who are so supportive. One of the Sundays that Gerard was in the hospital, I went to church, and as I walked in without my baby, people congratulated me. But when I saw one of my close friends, I burst into tears. Even though Gerard was fine, it was hard, and I knew my friend would let me cry with her. The book of Proverbs uses the words friend, brother, or sister to highlight the fact that in close, intimate relationships, we are called to be involved in one another's lives. When the author of Proverbs wants to talk about neighbors, he uses the word neighbors. When he wants to talk about strangers, he uses the word strangers, and he gives guidelines on how to um, treat both neighbors and strangers. In the context of entering 
into the emotional life of a person, however, he qualifies this privilege by defining the relationship as friend, brother, or sister. I won't be talking about parenting specifically, but because the overall framework of the book of Proverbs is presented as a parent, giving wise advice to a child who is about to enter the world of adult decisions, all of these guidelines are appropriate. I have a good friend who is not afraid to get in messy relationships. She is genuinely interested in people and she will walk with them through the good and through the bad. She makes everyone she knows feel like she is their best friend because she pours into their lives. She has the ability to speak into the lives of her friends because she takes the time to listen to them, to pray for them, to care for them, and to share her own life with them. Sometimes it backfires on her though, and I'm always shocked when she tells me of someone turning on her in a relationship. I mean, she's so amazing. Who could ever have a problem with her? And I believe that because she's so giving and she's willing to reach out to people who are truly hurting, that sometimes she gets bitten. But this is what a trusted friend does. They are there for the fun and the adventure, but they are also there when there is adversity and hardship. Even when they don't know how to comfort, they are willing to push into an uncomfortable realm in order to be a true friend in every circumstance. We are not guaranteed that everyone will respond in kind, but like my friend, we are affirmed in knowing that we have made the effort to be a trustworthy, reliable friend. We also read in Proverbs 27, 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man or woman's counsel is sweet to his or her friend. In this proverb, oil and perfume are equated to the sweet counsel of a friend. Proverbs 16.21 also uses the word sweet in reference to our words. A friend's counsel, if they are a good and a wise friend, which Proverbs assumes that they are, it has the power of cheering up the heart and meeting a deep need at the right time. The second guideline is that we are called to listen before we answer. Proverbs 18.13 says, the one who gives a word before he listens, it is foolishness to him and an insult. I love the way this proverb is phrased in Hebrew, which is how I've translated it. The one who gives a word before he listens. This is the person who's so busy crafting their response that they don't hear what the person is sharing. This is the person who responds before hearing the whole story. This is the person who may have great opinions to give, but considers permission to give one's opinion a mere formality. And this is a person who has preconceived notions about the other person's experience. So often we are quick to respond when we don't really know what's going on. Years ago, I became friends with a woman who was going through hardship after hardship in her life. She had every problem imaginable and every time I saw her, it got worse. I became very involved in her life and I tried to help her. I gathered other wise people around me to help, but nothing really changed for her. After a while, it was too much and I had to pull back. With hindsight, I had several realizations. One, she never really asked me for my help. Two, I never got her husband's perspective on the matter. I never really brought any other close voices into the situation. And three, after watching her year after year after year, I realized that drama and chaos are her normal and it was something she just needed in her life. So looking back, I wonder if I had just listened to her, how, had anything, how could anything have been different in our relationship? Proverbs 20 verse five says, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters but one who has insight draws them out. It takes time to unravel feelings, and we might not always be patient enough to let that happen. We might jump in to give advice. We don't want our spouse, our child, our friend to be hurting. We want to offer solutions, and we might have great solutions. It's hard to hear the pain, the anger, the confusion, or whatever it is that someone we care about might be sharing. 
but both of these Proverbs advise us to take a breath, to let the words flow, to let the tears fall, to hold a hand and be near. It doesn't tell us that we don't ever give an answer. It simply tells us to listen first. When we listen, we might hear something deeper than words. And when our spouse, child, or friend is ready for wisdom, then we speak. Or we ask permission to speak. Or we ask them what they want us to do. Do you A, want advice? B, want a listener who will let you vent without intervening? C, do you want me to ask thoughtful questions? Or D, do you just want a chocolate chip cookie? Because I can provide all of those if that's what you need. The third guideline is not to try to cheer a person up. The goal is admirable because we don't want to see other people in pain. We want the tears and the anguish to end. We want to be able to talk them out of the hurt and bring a smile to their face. We want everything to be better. When my kids were little and they were upset with me, all I had to do was tickle them and they would start laughing. And we could easily resolve small conflicts that way. But it only works for so long. A time comes when the pain is not about having to go to bed when you want to keep playing. The pain reaches further and deeper. Proverbs 25.20 says, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. I don't deny the power that laughter can have to lighten a mood or shift a perspective. And if you know my husband, you know his laugh. It is a true guffaw in every sense of the word. When it's time to leave church, the kids and I, if we can't find him, we just listen. And soon enough, we hear that big, loud, booming laughter, and we found him. When he's discouraged, sometimes he'll sit down on the couch and watch something on TV. And from the other room or the other end of the house, I hear his booming laughter. And I know that he's been lifted out of his mood, at least temporarily. So sometimes laughter is enough. This proverb, however, speaks to our tendency to want to talk people out of their feelings because we are uncomfortable. We sing songs to a heavy heart. It is not because we don't truly care or understand, but we want to make it better. We want it to be better for them. We want it to be better for ourselves. The problem is that what they're feeling is invalidated. And we say things like, you shouldn't feel that way. Don't cry. How can I make you feel better? Sometimes we even say these things to ourselves. But the feelings need to be acknowledged and felt. When we tell someone that they shouldn't feel a certain way, it's confusing and invalidating because they do feel a certain way. I have a friend whose first son left for college, first out of four, left for college several years ago, and she was a wreck for a long time. Every time I saw her, it's all she could talk about. At first, I was compassionate and I listened, listened but it got to the point where I was getting tired of hearing it. But the closer I got to my son leaving, I looked back and I wish I had sat and listened for however long she needed to grieve. The second proverb on this topic is Proverbs 27, 14. He who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. I will let you guess who um, in my household <laughs> this might be referencing. This proverb is slightly different, though. It begins by contrasting two types of people. Some people wake up singing, and some people like to sit quietly with a cup of coffee when they wake up. Well, this is true. The proverb underscores that we are to match the tone of the person with whom we are speaking. If someone is grieving, we sit in their grief. If someone is crying, we hold their tears. Both of these proverbs tell us that the power is not in cheering someone up, but in acknowledging what they're going through. The fourth guideline is to give a timely word. Read the following proverbs with me. A person finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word? Proverbs 15, 23. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Proverbs 25, 11. 
light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart, and good news gives health to the bones. Proverbs 15.30. The first two Proverbs correlate with what we looked at last week. A good word cheers up the heart. There are two elements involved in giving a timely word. The first is that we need to find an appropriate time and place to listen and respond. Second, we can be a fount of wisdom and understanding, but we can't always engineer the right timing in another person's life. Have you ever had someone come to you and tell you that what you said changed the way they thought about something or spoke deeply to their heart and you don't even remember saying it? When I was in my early years of seminary, and this was before I was married, I was talking to someone who ran a singles ministry in his church, and I made the comment that I had just visited a church, and they divided up their studies by age and by topic. So the studies, the one that I was interested in was studying the Book of Romans, but it was the 60-plus group. Um, 20-something me went to that group because I wanted to study Romans. And I told my friend that I, I... didn't really want to be limited by a category because I'm a person first who thirsts for God and secondarily I'm a category whether it's single, married, student, young, old, whatever that might be. The next time I saw him, he told me that what I said made him rethink how he approached his ministry. And I did, I'm like, okay, cool. And he said, you didn't really hear me. <laughs> what you said completely shifted how I think about the people who are under my care. Um, I was just sharing a perspective. I wasn't trying to engineer a perspective shift in this person, but God used that situation to do that. So we can't control when the timing for a right or an apt word is the right timing. But these proverbs go beyond a story like this, and they talk about the life-giving quality of a word that's rightly timed. It describes it as a perfect piece of jewelry, as bringing joy to the heart and life to our bones. Sometimes it takes effort on our part to find the right timing to share something. And sometimes it just takes consistent effort on our part to respond positively all the time to people. As you know, since the pandemic, I discovered TikTok and I've been scrolling quite a bit And I've come across these videos where people address negative comments that are left for them. And it's heartbreaking. People are told to go kill themselves. They're told they're too ugly to make a video. And there are so many hateful comments. Well, I don't make posts, so nobody's telling me that. And I don't really follow that many people. But I do make the effort when I come across a post that makes me laugh or touches my heart I make an effort to leave positive comments because I know that the people who make the videos read the comments. Um, And that's become a goal of mine, to leave positive comments behind wherever I go. This example is virtual, um, but we never know when a compliment or a heartfelt thank you is exactly what a person needs in a moment. We do know at the very least, it's almost always welcomed, and at the best, it's an opportunity to deeply bless other people. The final guideline is simple. Be honest and speak the truth. Proverbs 24, 26 says, he kisses the lips who gives a right or an honest answer. Although I don't consider myself to be a liar, if I'm honest, this is difficult for me. I'm very adverse to conflict, and in many situations, I'm afraid to be honest and speak truth. I'm also able to see more than one side to things, so it might look like I'm agreeing with someone when more likely I'm expressing the idea that you might be right. But this proverb is about more than giving our opinions. This proverb is about giving a right and an honest answer to someone with whom we are close. And I have given this as the final guideline because along with speaking a timely word, it is the last thing we should be doing. After we build relationship, after we listen, after we empathize, then if it's welcomed, we speak. 
And when we speak, we speak truth, we speak honesty, and we speak love. And who among us doesn't need that right now? Our whole world needs that right now. I want to thank you for listening to me and giving me the opportunity to come to your lives these past two weeks. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you care deeply about our heartache. Thank you that you show us how to address heartache. I pray for each one of us, wherever we are in our journey with you, that you would open our hearts up to experience your love, your care, and your community. And may you enable us to use the pain in our own lives to relate to others and to care for others. Thank you that you are a trusted friend, that you empathize, that you listen, and that you give us true and timely words. In Jesus' name, amen.